you how ASDAL and indeed uh, the pre-ASDAL librarians work together cooperatively to accomplish some really great things. The same holds true this week. Adventist Resources within the library context is, to, is set to make a major step forward through the development of the Adventist Digital Library. First, I would like to review uh, some of the cooperative steps taken in the more distant and not so distant past. And then um, we'll ask Merlin Bird to come on and talk about the more recent history. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, review the, um, the bio for Merlin, and then I'll, I'll do my part and we'll bring him on. Um, Merlin is the director of the Andrews University Center for Adventist Research and serves also as the director of the Andrews University branch office of the Allen G. White Estate, where he has been since 2003. Prior to coming, coming to Andrews, Merlin served as chair of the Loma Linda University's Library's Department of Archives and Special Collections and director of the branch office there as well. He served in this capacity from the early 1990s, so when, when Jim Nix left, Merlin took his place. Merlin has published articles, book chapters. He has one book that I guess is more or less out, or it's almost out, and a couple more in the in process. He has served as speaker, editor, and organizer at various conferences, symposiums, and denominational history tours. His hobbies include collecting Adventist materials, woodworking, and his granddaughter. The passion that Seventh-day Adventists connect God's leading to the, in the past to a personal Christian experience. Okay, I would like to take you back to the 1930s through the 1960s as we start. As Adventist librarians met and talked together, there was a strong interest to develop various indexes to periodicals to aid research. In those days, their work was limited to sets of card files. You may remember these kinds of things. I'm sure you all have them in your, your libraries, maybe even now. You use the other, other side for notes, right? <laughs> but these were laboriously typed on manual typewriters. Remember those things? By, by very few of you even have a manual typewriter, let alone an electric typewriter in your library. I, I don't think we do. We used to make uh, little spine labels. But I think those have uh, disappeared now even. So somehow we use a printer to make them work. And uh, type, uh, student workers at a desk working for hours on, on end typing. I'm sure a few of you here are old enough to remember the rooms full of card catalogs we used to deal with. Um, when I started my current position 23 years ago, I had one student worker. That's all they did was keep the card catalog current with the new cards that were being put in. I remember in my graduate work, went to the Library of Congress. I guess we'll be there on Wednesday. I don't know how much of it we'll see, but the, um, I remember rooms and hallways lined with catalog cards, card catalog, these big cabinets. It was quite impressive. Well, that was, that, most of you remember those, some part of those days. Well, this was the environment our predecessors lived in. We have in our center at least one, perhaps two of these sets of file cards uh, indexing one or more Adventist periodicals. They were likely useful, but only for those who could physically come to use them. During these years, uh, Theofold Weiss, uh, from what is, was then known as Washington Missionary College, now Washington Adventist University, developed a rather full set of these index cards. He came on the edge of a new wave of disseminating information in the library world called microfilm. It wasn't really new, but I don't know that we were using it much before then. The Weiss Index was microfilmed, and it was then possible to distribute it around the world. About this time, it appears that the Review and Herald, the magazine, 
index was also put onto microfilm with the same worldwide circulation. These are obviously huge steps forward in aiding research. In the late 1960s, librarians gathered for a couple of different meetings, and out of these meetings grew what we know as the Seventh Avenue Empirical Index. Jen mentioned that uh, a little bit earlier today. And I do happen to have a copy of the first pilot project issue for January, March 1969, where you, you were involved in this one. That was really before your time there. But uh, this is uh, three months' worth of uh, indexing. Yeah, actually, uh, Keith Clout and Marilyn Crane's name is in the um, introduction. The, the printed index project took off as a great idea, though it struggled financially through the first couple of decades. It ceased for a year or two here and there until it got more secure financial footing with an influx of money from the General Conference and a more viable funding model. So we are now actually in our 45th year of the index. So it's, we're approaching that 50 year mark. In those days, there was little option other than either print or microfilm. To microfilm, you needed to print first anyway. As time went on, the printed index became more bulky. Now you had this small thing, but a lot of you will remember later they got quite thick when you had a whole year or several years worth in it. And as it gets thicker, it costs more to print, it costs more to mail, mailing costs are going up. The index transferred to Andrews University in 1992 in part to save on labor costs. Not long after that, the possibility presented itself to put the index online. For those of you who remember the early 1990s, you will recall the early browsers such as Netscape. Now known as Firefox, mm -hmm. and dial-up modems where you could cook an egg while you waited for your results to come in. <laughs> through, through the vision of then SDAPI managing editor Harvey Bernaysi and the support of the index board, he moved the index from print only to an online plus a print if you needed it. Print became an option for those who did not have an internet connection. Through time, we dropped the print and moved to a CD-ROM. Recently, that too was dropped, so we are only an online resource today. The SD Periodical Index is probably the single biggest project ASDAL has undertaken and kept going. We are all to be commended for this endeavor that has helped untold thousands of researchers throughout the years and around the world. Beyond the periodical index, ASDAL has cooperated in several other projects which I'll not try to enumerate for fear of forgetting some. Through the years, ASDAL and ARS have cooperated to bring together quite a, a list of resources uh, uh, exclusive outside of the, the different projects. Here are some of them. SDA Materials Manuscript Location, Unified Collection Development Policy, Cooperative SDA Obituary Index, and a lot of you have been involved with the Obituary Index through the years. The SDA Bibliography to 1870, the Dissertation Index, International Cooperation and Adventist Resources, the Three-Tier Concept of Manuscript Collection Acquisition, the SDA Union List of Journal Titles, a virtual SDA library, an online catalog search, SDA classification schedule, ARS webpage, photograph image databases, photograph imaging guidelines and procedures, an LNG White bibliography, strategic planning, cooperation and coordination, guidelines for scanning text. So there's been a lot of work that's gone on within the ASDA in, in, in an effort to cooperate and coordinate our efforts. In preparing for this presentation, I went to the Adventist Resources page of the ASDAL website where a number of these resources I just mentioned may be accessed. There's quite a lot of useful information there, but several of the items I clicked on include the master list of SDA manuscript collections, a PDF document 
led me to a 404 message. I think most of you know what that is. Some work is needed here. So as Dahl and the Adventist Resources section have had a track record of working cooperatively to achieve success in small and large projects. As in other parts of our life and our work, success requires a degree of vision, leadership, perseverance, and in some cases, money doesn't hurt. Beginning in earnest in 2004 at the Asdell Conference at Florida Hospital College of Health Science, the ARS program began to focus on coordination and cooperation in providing Adventist resources. The General Conference archivist, Bert Holobiak, talked about their digital endeavors at that point. This was followed by a panel discussion entitled Strategic Planning, Cooperation and Coordination. For 2005 and 2006, the same theme carried forward with at least one presentation plus considerable talk about cooperation and coordination in the rapidly evolving area of digital resources. The year 2007 was a bit of a hiatus as ASDA was on the road in South Africa. In 2008, things really heated up at Loma Linda. I gave a presentation titled Cooperation and Coordination, Where To Now? For those of you who were there, you will remember the long discussion we had. I, I hold here a copy of the minutes from that meeting. Um, comments from this one session alone occupied two pages of the minutes. So it was a considerable amount of uh, discussion. There was a groundswell of excitement about cooperatively developing a centralized database of Adventist digital resources. A lot of ideas flew around. Some of you there will remember Christina's Missoula, Montana concern about the church record books from the church there in Montana. In the end, a subcommittee with Joel Lutz, Christina Thompson, Tony Zabarischuk, Lori Curtis, and myself was set up to try to bring these ideas to fruition. Through the following year, the subcommittee met by a teleconference numerous times. We came up with the name AdventistResources.org, as well as a mission statement, goals, some procedures, definite ideas for personnel, hardware, and funding, and a list of digitization standards for others to follow who may wish to contribute. Next year's conference, 2009, at, at Andrews University was a very heady time for AdventistResources.org. A major presentation was given to the conference and a presentation was also given to the Alice Council meeting. There was much discussion during the conference. During the course, the subcommittee met together several times and, and decided upon using content DM software based at Loma Linda University. Loma Linda was graciously willing to share it with ASDAL. Some funds were voted by Alice and an action set up a committee was voted by the ASDAL business session. It seemed AdventistResources.org was about ready to blast off the launching pad. In the fall of 2009, the committee was ready to move on content DM. Enough money was raised in commitments and some money in actually in hand for the startup. Then we heard about the newly developing White Estate platform. It came to us with lots of promises and lots of flexibility in its functioning. Best of all, it'd be free or next to that and we could all sh share it along with having the support and help from the experienced White Estate team. Combine this good news with rising doubts about the suitability of content DM for what we wanted it to do. The committee decided to step back and see what the White State platform would actually be like in reality. They finally unveiled it just ahead of the 2010 GC session. As our committee looked at what was the White State platform, we realized uh, it would probably not work for what we wanted, at least not without a lot of reprogramming. Uh, the weight obviously hurt the momentum generated at the 2009 conference. The uncertainty about the software, the suitability of it for what we were doing, as well as the significant downturn in the econ national economy made it a difficult time to raise operating funds. 
at this point, AdventistResources.org, where they're sputtered out. It was a great idea. A lot of work went into it, but it didn't live up to its promise, I feel, for these reasons. Software, uncertainty about which to use, which led to delay and then disappointment when we couldn't make it work without a lot of um, reprogramming. Money, we were unsure where it would come from for short term as well as an ongoing commitment into the future. And access to staff time, none of us involved were top bosses and, we, and if we were, we didn't have the staff available to sign to work on the project. So that it, was, it was all added to the work that we were already doing and we didn't have really the, the technical wherewithal to, to do what needed to be done and we were unable to call upon those who did. This leads us to the rest of the story, at least as far as it's been written to this point. So I'd like to bring on Merlin Bird at this point. Um, I've already introduced him from Andrews University. Um, he is the lead person in a team of three individuals who have brought Avis Digital Library to where it is today. The other two members are Jim Nix from the White Estate, and which you've already met, and David Trim, who had some good words for us just a few moments ago. Um, so Ron will talk about how AdventistResources.org became the Adventist Digital Library. I'm not sure about lead person. I think it's more of a partnership that David Trim and Jim and I have had at least most recently. But the truth is, I, I want to just stop and talk about my involvement in this and just then bring us up to the present. I came to Loma Linda University in 1993 um, from being a pastor. And my work was mostly, and has been, I still, my first identity is ministerial. And as a pastor, I realized the great need that our church has for a sense of spiritual identity. We're living many decades, century, almost two centuries from when the Millerite movement occurred, and many Adventists are more just cultural Adventists the reality of what the message is is not a burning reality. They're, they're what I have sometimes referred to, and I heard it first from HMS Richard Sr., their grandchildren in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Instead of, as the Bible describes in 1 John 3, verse 1, and, and the first few verses, they're sons and daughters of God. And so this sense of identity, what is it to be a Seventh-day Adventist, became something very important to me in my ministerial work, which is why I ended up saying, yes, I will come to Loma Linda and I will be the director of White State Office and chair of Archives and Special Collection. It was a traumatic shift for me because I had been preaching every Sabbath. I had been working and now I'm in a library. I didn't have the persona of librarian in my psyche. And I have had almost 21 years now interacting with librarians, so I think I've got a little bit of the psyche. But I went a little different course, again, having to do with Adventist identity and these needs. I felt I, my, my abilities and my interest were more in the area of history. And so I ended up with the support of Loma Linda, which I'm very grateful for, as well as the White Estate, getting a degree in um, Church history, having a studies through Andrews University. And so that was what I ended up doing. So in my mind, this whole thing of Adventist resources, Adventist identity, all rolled together. And so there is that, that spiritual importance for me that drives my interest in this. Now, when I came to Loma Linda, well, it's hard to follow Jim Nix anywhere. Um, he had been gone a year and a something, so it was nice that there was a little, a little delay. <clears throat> I 
began to work. And Carlene was there. She was not the director of the library, but I remember us visiting and talking, and there were some others as well. And one of the first things I began to work on was digital materials. Uh, we had something wonderful there. I suppose you don't mind me mentioning it, Barnard Endowment. And we began to think in terms of digitization. And one of the early things we did was to begin to digitize photographs. And I think some of those photographs are still on the database, I presume, Lori. And Lori's continued the digitization uh, in later years. But uh, we began to think in terms of digitization. And those were early days of internet. I remember using CompuServe and the modems and so forth. And the whole idea of something being electronically in a central place where everyone could look at it like the internet was still a stretch for the mind and the imagination, at least for mine. I don't know, some of the rest of you must have been better visionaries than me, but as, it, as the internet began to come on, it was just amazing. And we, we weren't sure how it could, could all happen. Now in those days, I interacted with Jim Ford. He was at Andrews University, and he also was digitizing photographs and doing some digitization. So we had these, these early digitization efforts that we worked on. Um, I'm supposed to be telling the current history, so I've got to stop telling that whole thing. But when I came to Andrews University, that same focus on digitization didn't stop. And as a part of our initial um, strategic planning, we looked at this issue. And we had had a number of initiatives at the Center for Adventist Research um, over the years since I've been there to try to do digitization, and we have begun to work on things. And so digitization has been important. Now, to avoid going through all the discussion of ASDAL, I don't want to do that because Jim's done it, I guess my history kind of comes in in that lull that he talked about there after about 2009, um, 10, right in there. At the Center for Adventist Research, where, where we are, we were continuing to do digitization. It was important. And whatever ASDAL did, we were going to continue to do work in this area. Now, the White Estate had been working aggressively before that and, and from that point on to get resources um, together for the White Estate website. And so we had a synergy of resources and work that let us continue to do some further digitization work and develop our understanding more about digitization. One of the things we did was digitize or scan the foreign language Ellen White books. And I remember at the Oshkosh in, um, it's been almost 10 years now, or was it? 2009. Um, five years ago, almost, because we're coming up to Oshkosh again. Um, Daryl and I talked, and we started doing scanning for the White Estate, and it was very, very helpful. It helped us learn and gain some competency as well, and we made some mistakes. Thank you for being merciful to us when we stumbled a few times. And so we were digitizing already at the Center for Adventist Research and doing things for the White Estate, and they helped provide some resources to do that. We were delighted when uh, we, the decision was made in 2009 for the place to be at Loma Linda with Content at the end. I personally kind of gave a big sigh of relief, and I said, thank you, Lord. It's going to be there. And so we continued to work in this interim and in this lull. And uh, when we realized that Content DM might not work exactly for this project, maybe it would still work, I don't know. But it seemed to not be the best project. And we continued to work with the White Estate. We began to explore the idea of how we might use the White Estate software that they were developing for their resources to also work for an Adventist digital library. Now it was at the ASDAL at Pacific Union College um, that I met David Trim. Maybe we'd met previously, I'm not sure, David. I, had, I think in New Bold we'd met 
previously, but we hadn't really talked and had conversations. But I remember us having a very uh, focused conversation discussing uh, some of your vision and desire for what the GC archives might do as far as digitization and what we were doing at the center as well. And so these discussions begin to, to grow between at least the three of us. And uh, that led to a cooperation between our three organizations to try to think it over time, to think of how we might um, develop uh, an Adventist digital library. And we've continued to work on that and have come to the point where I think God has opened a, a remarkable opportunity for us. Uh, you're going to hear after the break, or have, after I do a little spiritual sharing, uh, Julie Johnson described the, or show you the, at least the beta that we've been working with, and you'll find it's quite interesting. It's come a long ways. I know there'll be a lot of questions and discussions, but um, we have, have felt that this particular software does have real potential, and I think others have looked at it, and we're very, very hopeful that it will, will work well. But um, the Adventist Digital Library, um, I think this year, I'll, let, me, let me describe a little bit what happened last year, because last May, as Jim Nix, David Trim, and I have been working, we thought this really has been a library initiative over the years, and we would like to find a way in which we can really come together cooperatively more to, to plan how this might work. And that led to the meeting last May. Now, I'm just curious for the group that's here, how many of you were present at that meeting? I just want to see your hands. So it's a maybe half of this group, maybe just a little bit more, came. And we spent some concentrated time looking at the concept. There was a beta version that was shown by Daryl. Um, I'm going to be like Jim Nix here and just be kind of frank. Anyway. It didn't seem to look workable very well. Am I right? It was like, okay, there's promise, but how is that really going to work? And so there were still questions, I think, in my perception, in the minds of librarians as to, is this software really going to be workable? And on our part, the, the three of us, as we were, David, Trim, Jim, and I, we have, were seeing that there was further work and that it would come together. None of us were able to come to the ASDAL meeting last year. and. I think there was a presentation there that also didn't quite, I wasn't there so I can't say it, quite show clearly how the, the material would actually be used and be accessible and how the database would work, which left questions in the mind of, I think, some many of you. I think many of you were there and there was that, that feeling. And so no action was taken, maybe there was an action taken, but no definitive action was taken at that point. Um, towards the end of the year, and then it was just kind of a lull because everyone was busy, we continued to work on digital issues. Julie Johnson had already been with us, and Julie's been doing a wonderful job bringing our digital work together there at the center. And uh, around December, November, December, it was a little bit before that, um, I kind of stepped in to try to see what I could do to figure out what was happening. We talked to David and Jim and I to try to see if there's some way we could discuss this work on a little bit more and really make it work cooperatively with ASDAL and uh, our three organizations. We had a meeting with Alice. I think at this point uh, Paulette and I began to talk more around the end of the year. and. We had some meetings. There had been some committees that had been formed at the May meeting with tasks to be done. And when things kind of went into limbo, those committees kind of were unresolved. And that was a little bit of frustration, I think, 
on the Astol side, rightly so, um, the truth was we were not, I think, quite sure what the next step was going to be and how it was going to go. But I think during discuss in discussions with all of us, the, the, some of the ALICE members and ALICE and our three organizations, we have come to, I think, a point that is a little quite different from what we had initially thought might happen as to how ADL would be able to operate. And I think if I could, I'd like to take just a minute to present some of that just right here, and then in the next session we'll talk more about it. I think from the beginning the challenge has been resources. How are we going to make this happen financially? How can it actually come together? Resources. As uh, we have worked at Andrews on digitization and learn the type of things that we'd need to do to effectively digitize our materials and what might be involved to try to include other institutions' materials, we have realized that we probably are going to need at least two staff persons to make this work or two um, capable permanent workers to make this work. And of course we are also at, at Andrews hosting the SDAPI in the, it's being developed and worked there. And so we begin to think of how those two organizations also might integrate. And so we have come together with a budget I think that is, I hope, realistic. I think it is. That involves two and a half FTEs, including uh, if this organization decides to go with it, uh, bringing SDAPI as a part of that. Uh, the com major components of the budget, which is about $260,000, involves, let me just list them for you, involves uh, Andrews University providing the digitization manager's expenses and some of the other um, local expenses as well as hosting the uh, ADL uh, to the tune of about $75,000, $78,000. The ASDAL organization, the latest budget, uh, is 83000 I guess you said 171 I don't know if 171 is crucial, but anyway, about $83,000 is what the uh, SDAPI uh, budget has been. Uh, we were thrilled to be able to meet last month, um, David Trim, uh, Jim Nix, Lisa Beardsley, who is the um, Director of Education for the General Conference, and also Neil Zarek Andreas and the President of Andrews University with Bob Lemon. And his, we'll go through this carefully with him, the proposal, and we have uh, been thrilled to have his uh, desire to uh, present to appropriate committees a recommendation to fund $75,000 for the Adventist Digital Library. He recommended at that point that the North American Division also partner, and the North American Division has, at least I haven't talked to them, David, you actually made the communication, but uh, Larry Blackmer has been enthusiastic about this, is that correct? But it still has to go through the committee process, as does the GC, as does the GC for a $25,000 participation. Now, if those four components come together, we have the workings of the budget for an Avenus Digital Library. There's one additional component that uh, is very interesting. And this is an idea actually that we've thought about before, but came with new energy from uh, Dr. Andreas and Niels Eric Andreas, and as we were talking together, and that is to have a partnership with research university libraries around the world because they are beneficiaries in an Adventist Digital Library, the resources of an Adventist Digital Library. And when we 
took this idea also to to the treasurer of the general conference. He felt that it's hard to depend upon that for a, a, a basic operating budget because what happens if your partnerships begin to stumble, you have personnel and these type of things. Hence his suggestion that we proceed according to the model I described. But that does not mean that we would not still have partnership with research universities around the world. And I don't think he would mind me sharing this. In fact, I know he wouldn't. You'll hear from him in a taped message in just a little bit, some of his thoughts, not about this, but on the idea of having a digital library. But he was recently at AUA, um, our university in Africa, and was talking with the folk there and there was great enthusiasm and he told me that they were actually begging to participate maybe begging is too strong of a term but uh, um, aggressively requesting and uh, he feels that there is a five thousand dollar commitment from them from their organization you see they would benefit from these resources because they could actually use them because they're physical library book resources are, are much more limited, at least as it relates to Adventist materials. And we have a new Ellen White Estate branch office there as well for students who are, who are wanting to work in the area of understanding Ellen White and Adventist studies issues. So if, with this kind of preliminary discussion, I think that there is hope that there would be further partnership from other universities which would supplement this budget and let us I think work more um, aggressively maybe on other projects, other collections uh, beyond just the core digitizing that we're needing to do. So these are the dimensions of, just for introduction for you here, the dimensions of the plan. Uh, I have felt all along it was very important and I think you folks have demonstrated by the history and we have by our history. Um, the importance of ASDAL being involved. Now just to, to speak frankly, I think that one of the challenges that ASDAL has had is it's looked at the Adventist Digital Library, as I said earlier, is resources. Can the ASDAL actually fund a full Adventist Digital Library work project to the level that we've just been describing? It seems to not be too realistic. And so it's, it has appeared that the most effective way to make this work is to bring together the SDPI, which naturally does have dimensions, and we'll hear more about this, that connect well with the Adventist Digital Library, and thus have ASDAL as a full partner of the, this project of the Adventist Digital Library. As far as uh, just a few thoughts on governance, because I know this was one of the committees. Uh, we aren't talking about technical yet. I think tomorrow we're going to talk specifically about some of the technical materials when Julie's presenting this afternoon. No, thank you. Um, when Julie's presenting more on the database. But uh, because of the broader input of the various organizations to bring together an Avidus Digital Library, um, the board is at least being proposed to be a uh, representing the contributors, those that are participating. And so it's, it does involve pending the participation of ASDAL. It does involve strong ASDAL representation. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the, at the moment how we're thinking of as a board, just trying to be fair to the various parts. Uh, it would be, at this point, it's proposed that the pre president of Andrews University would be the chair, uh, the director of the Center for Adventist Research the secretary, and the recording secretary, Jim Ford. Then the other library participation would be the dean of libraries for Andrews University and the director of uh, library of, at Loma Linda, libraries at Loma Linda, and then two other ASDAL representatives that ASDAL would select. Uh, other board members would include um, General Conference Archive Statistics and Research Director, Education 
General Conference Education Director, someone from General Conference Treasury, uh, the Vice President of Education of the North American Division, and up to two representatives from supporting research libraries if that project is able to um, continue to develop and be effective. They would only meet on an annual basis, uh, probably around the time of the um, um, annual meetings of the General Conference, because that's when the people would be together most effectively probably for that to work. Um, but this is just in brief the idea of how this project uh, might work and just to give you some sort of an introduction to this. Um, I will stop now because I think we need to go to a break and we'll have time for questions maybe as we get a little further into the morning and into the afternoon. Carly, have a question. Yes, Carly. I, I don't have a question, but you mentioned the Barnard Committee, and, I, and since we talked about Jim Nix this morning, I, there are a lot of people here, pro, or Barnard Endowment, that Loma Linda has, that Barnard Endowment is a direct result of Jim's work at Loma Linda, and that was an endowment from his grandfather's mm -hmm. funds that is for the collection and dissemination of Adventist history at Loma Linda Community. So just wanted to give that since you mentioned it, and I'm sure there are people here who didn't know that. Thank you again, Jim. Thank you, Carlene, for clarifying that. Yeah, that was a uh, wonderful foresight that uh, happened. What year was that 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 was? It was before I came in 1981 when he passed away. So it's just a word. Does anybody know anyone around that has money? Put your <laughs> <blank> on. <laughs> anybody knows someone that has money? I mean, I'll admit this was my granddad, but he was going to give it to the conference. I said, why would you put it in that big pond? <laughs> give it to something unique that can make a difference. At least it worked with him. I don't know if it worked with other people, but <laughs> just throwing your money into a big pond in the conference, what a, give, to give something to your library. Okay, if we could try to be back here at 1020.